You're listening to Passions and Prologues, a literary podcast where each week I interview an author about a thing they love and how it inspires their work. I'm your host, Adam Sokol, and today's guest is Margaret Owen. She is the best-selling author of the brand new young adult book, Little Thieves. You may also know Margaret from her Merciful Crow duology that came out um, a few years back. She writes the just most wonderful fantasy stories. Merciful Crows had this incredible magic system and this very complex world building that I just adored. And Little Thieves is very much the same way. Again, I mentioned it debuted as a best-selling title and it is so well-deserved. I've had the chance to interview Margaret a few times in the past. It was so great to catch up with her for this conversation. She is one of these people who just is so engaging and captivating and listening to her talk about how she breaks down her story is so interesting. The topic that we discuss is art in general at first, but then more specifically the types of art that she got into first as a child, then as a young adult, and now uh, as a full-blown adult who is writing books and also doing the illustrations for her own stories. It is crazy how talented she is. It's also just fun to hear someone talk about their past in a way where she's diving into these little random moments that she remembered as we were having a conversation about things she likely hadn't thought about in in a long, long time. So I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. And again, if you're a, a fan of fantasy novels at all, I highly, highly recommend checking out Little Thieves. And if you haven't yet read the Merciful Crow duology yet, check out both those books as well. As we are in summer, I am thinking about travel and restaurants and all that good stuff. And so I want to give you a book recommendation that I am just about finished with. It's called A Waiter in Paris. It's by Edward Chisholm, and it is a nonfiction memoir about his experience as a literally waiter in Paris. He is from England originally. He goes to Paris. He is learning French, and he kind of climbs the ranks through what it's like to work in a Parisian restaurant versus a runner and then how to learn all about the wine and then into the specific stories about what it was like being a waiter in a very, very popular restaurant in France. I think you're really, really going to like a waiter in Paris if you're a fan of memoirs, food, travel, or any of the like. If you would ever like any more book recommendations from me, you can always send me an email at passionsandprologues at gmail.com. I'm happy to answer any questions you have there. Also, I leave, I give a random bookshop.org gift card once a month to a listener who sends me the things that they are passionate about. Love to hear all the things that you guys enjoy in your daily lives too. And you can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at Passions and Prologues, where I am sharing book recommendations and all sorts of things all the time. Okay. That is all of the housekeeping. I am so excited for you guys to hear this conversation with Margaret Owen, author of Little Thieves on Passions and Prologues. Okay, Margaret, what is something that you are super passionate about that we're going to be discussing today? So this is going to be very broad, but art, I think, (laughs) is is the the way to go. (laughs) Art is pretty broad, but we can make it work. So let's, Mm -hmm. let's start at the beginning. What was your kind of first experience with art when you were younger? Kind of what made you travel down that path as a kid? So my dad is a graphic designer, and um, one thing that he did that was super nerdy and very Portlandian uh, was uh, he and his friend had basically me and his friend's daughter write and illustrate a Mother's Day book. And when I, when I was like, bye. So, you know, these are top-notch quality. <laughs> like, the, these illustrations should be in the Louvre. Um, <laughs> There, there, there's a lot of creative use of ovals. Let's just put it uh-huh, that way. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, his his friend's daughter did the writing, and I did the art. And I think at some point, that's when my parents were like, "Oh, she's an artist," which is a leap I never would have made. <laughs> <laughs> looking back at my previous work, however, um, yeah, no, I I think I was just always the kid who was like, 
here's a here's a picture of a princess fill in the the colors you know if you gave me a piece of paper and some crayons i would be down for the count for hours <laughs> so it was good and then i just never stopped <laughs> mm-hmm. i so weirdly you mentioning a book i mm-hmm. i have this memory because i think my mom found it like relatively recently we were looking at it and when i was in i want to say 5th grade so a little bit older obviously but we had to like there was this competition in our community where mm-hmm. you wrote a story and then same thing, you kind of like illustrated it, but I, I use, we used clip art. Um, yes. And it oh, was like, thank God. Yeah. And it was like, you wrote this story and, and like the winners got to miss a day of school because you went to the local community college where in the auditorium, they like had these awards for it. So yeah. And my mom like found, there was something about a cowboy. My mom listens to this, so she's definitely going to remember and let me know what it is. <laughs> But it was like I, when I, I looking back on that, I can see like, OK, I definitely always loved writing, but it is mm-hmm. quite obvious that I was not an artiste. So that that was like the extent where it was like, maybe maybe we give Adam books. Maybe he doesn't want to color anything. But, you know, from that moment <laughs> on, you said like, you know, you, would you know, crayons and, and paper and stuff could mm-hmm. entertain you for hours. But so what um, what path did that did that take you down? Like, how did art follow you as you became an younger, a younger adult or an older child. You're right. <laughs> uh, it's, it's funny. I had a, a, another recalled memory as you were talking um, about. Um, so in like, oh, I think that they started in like first grade, second grade. Um, what they would do is have an adult volunteer come to the classroom and sit down with kids and type up a story that a kid would tell them and they'd break it into different pages and then ring bind it into a blank book that you then illustrated and I have like a whole raft like there there is there's a a first edition Margaret Owen um that is like almost exclusively various ripoffs of horse books that I was reading at the Mm -hmm. moment (laughs) so there's like I think there's one where like Black Beauty makes a very unlicensed cameo (laughs) there's um there's a story there's there's a whole story where like and I think this this thread resurfaces in my work a lot um, of uh, a girl saving her best friend, but there's an entire page that's very much like, but I don't like him like that, okay? We're just friends. Because, you know, at the age of of seven, that was very important to stress. Um, I don't want to cut you off, but I love that at the age of seven, you were already inserting the the slightly tropey (laughs) will they, won't they, which everyone loves in a a fantasy And I was like, solidly, will not, will not. Mm-hmm. It was great. Um, but yeah, the the art is a little bit challenging in those. But uh, I think, you know, this idea that, um, or like, you know, at, at a young age, um, having this this thing where like, I, I made a book, I made a book. And, you know, of course, it's like, you know, the, the floppy flinty little thing. But it's still something that I was able to make and hold on to. And that was really important. And the other thing that was kind of tricky about that is that um, I didn't get diagnosed with like, or like, so I'm extremely nearsighted, mm-hmm. and I, they didn't find that out until I was like eight, maybe. I didn't get glasses until I was like, I want to say a second grade, mm-hmm. and I learned to read before I could actually see the letters, <laughs> like from a distance at least. Um, and you would think that my parents would have figured it out when I was like holding my book like an inch from my face. Yeah, and yet, uh, <laughs> that's my little bit of shade there. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think that that informed how I approached art because a lot of stuff that I think about is like how like the bigger shapes, right? Bright colors, big shapes. That's how the world looked to me as a kid. Mm -hmm. And being able to, in retrospect, it makes sense to me that I gravitated more towards art first than writing Mm -hmm. simply because I didn't like I could, I didn't have, I wasn't able to to read that much, but I was able to see what I was drawing, even if it was like, you know, two inches from my face. (laughs) Yeah, no, I. That does make a lot of sense. And it's interesting how there's so many examples where people talk about like the the way you see the world or like the way you take mm-hmm. in music when you're a certain age is like the music you always think is the best. And like the the like most basic version I always think of is everyone always talks about like the Saturday Night Live cast that was when you were like 12 years old is always everyone's favorite. Yes. But it's true for like, I love how you're saying it about art. Like, I remember when I was really, really young watching The Mummy with my parent, like the Brendan Fraser Mummy. Mm-hmm. And like, cool. it just, 
naturally. Naturally, of course. Yeah, I actually have a t <laughs> somewhere that says the 1990, the 1990, whatever, a cinematic classic, The Mummy is perfect. Like, and, right. but I like, because of that, that particular movie has colored, like, if I see a book that is somewhat based in like Egypt or like I'm like drawn to those types of stories. So I see, it makes perfect sense. And you say like for the first, you know, several years of your life when you were really, your brain was formulating the types of stories or like things you like to interact with, mm-hmm. you were drawn to, like you said, these big shapes, these like things that you could right. see because you really couldn't see the rest of the world. Right. And one of the things that I think, you know, looking back on that also sort of came through was that once I actually had glasses, I was just like, this is what the world looks like. And I was like, mom, I can read the signs. Are there's are those needles on the trees? Like pine needles, because I was growing up in, you know, Portland and this just Christmas tree capital of the world. Um, but, uh, you know, I'd be like, those are, I could actually see the leaves on the trees. I can see you know, all these things that were only available to me if I had like my face right up, like really close to them before. And like, I have a, rem- a memory of being, I want to say like six, maybe five, and walking in the backyard and almost walking directly into this massive spider web because I didn't even see it. Like, I didn't even see the spider in the middle of it. It was like a Legend of Zelda spider, I swear to God. And um, I didn't even see it until I was like, you know, six inches away. And then I was like, I'm done with spiders for the rest of my life. Yeah. Uh, but having access all of a sudden to this massive level of detail in the world, um, I think it gave me a, a almost an appreciation for the difference between, you know, when something is very distant and blurred out versus really, you know, hyper, hyper detailed. And I feel like I tend to grab it. I tend to you know, swing between those two things in, in my writing, too, in a weird way. No, I, I was you kind of beat me to it. I was just going to ask, like, is that is that how you approach stories? Like looking at it first from like a very like a wide lens or an extremely extremely narrow lens. You, you kind of beat me too. But I guess, how would you say, like, you don't have to go into detail about like the specifics of a book, but like, how would you say that that has shown up in your writing? Mm-hmm. I, um, I definitely do have visual elements, a lot of which like sort of stay in the, the you know, the, the not the lost media, but you know, the, 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 the back, the, the backstage of the book, as it were, <laughs> all the stuff that went into the into the story that you'll never see. Um, so, you know, I right now I'm working on the the third book for Little Thieves, and um, I have like Noah some three maps, a lot of spreadsheets, <laughs> and I'm just constantly consulting. And like I think about things like what are these, you know, what colors are affiliated with what, what images are affiliated with what and why, what is the, I, I visualize everything, uh, you know, that, that thing that was floating around Twitter for a little while, like, when someone says Apple, what do you see in your mind? And it's got like, you know, nothing, and then like a red blur, and then the, the spectrum all the way to the perfect detailed Apple. And for me, it's always the detailed Apple. Yeah. <laughs> Which is great. Um, but I think, um, in terms of writing, you know, I think a lot about the visuals of a scene, which is, tricky because then I have to also remember to incorporate the other senses. <laughs> yeah, no. um, I think about like things like lighting and and um, I will storyboard out uh, really complicated action sequences to make sure I'm not like having someone simultaneously in w- inhabiting one spot and another 30 feet away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? um, I will um, think about things like textures and, um, you know, I think it, it, being, it, developing art forces you to think a lot about not just what you can see but how you can communicate more like so like it's one thing to just visualize an apple it's another to paint one in a way with like the light hitting it and like a a, a, you know a slice on or a slice on a plate and it almost glows and you can smell the apple you know and that kind of um that's that's a, a a skill set that you develop with art and it's good to translate it into writing too. Um, so yeah, I think there's that. And then like, it also affects how I have approached outlining. I definitely take a, a, a approach that was derived from um, the, the, like, the approach I take for big illustrations, which is you have a thumbnail, uh, which is very loose, small sketch that you see to, you know, block out the, the major shapes and make sure that it reads. And then you develop that into a larger, more detailed sketch than you, ink that and then you color that and render it out and um 
that is very similar to my outlining process, just in different stages. <laughs> but that's so interesting. I, I'm, I'm wondering if you've ever had any, I mean, obviously, like, you know, you are an incredible writer and like you have stories that people oh, yes. adore. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, like, have you, had you ever considered going into, I'm almost like the way that you're describing everything, I almost think of like, um, you know, not even like writing for TV, but more so like stage, like, like Ooh, stage, stage produ- production, like stage production. Oh, yeah, exactly. Like, it, did you ever think of going down that route? Um, I, so I was a theater kid, but I was, I was in the backstage um, for most of this. <laughs> I think I had a very brief stint hilariously as Scrooge in high school in a very stripped down production. Um, <laughs> It was very classic, like high school theater department. Mm -hmm. But uh, long story short, that was one of the things that I did in high school that also helped me think about like landscape approach um, is I helped paint sets and I helped build sets. And um, I helped with, I I didn't do a lot of the costume work just because like they were like, oh, we have someone who can actually do painting stuff. We need that on the, we need that with with the scenery. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, that definitely helped me think about not just, you know, um, how to set up a scene in terms of like writing. Um, cause I think there's a whole thing you could talk about, um, in terms of like how you ap- apply the principles of stage production to writing, especially for things like YA. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, it also helped me think of, um, oh, where was I going with this? Um, like <laughs> there was, <laughs> It, it helped me think in terms of um, what level of detail you need to communicate something mm-hmm. in, like, and how much art, like audience participation you are requiring of your audience to buy into this illusion. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is a, a, a very important thing for, for authors to, to, to consider, you know? Yeah, I, so it, this is going to be a strange way of getting this, but this reminds me of there is a Stephen Sondheim musical um, Sundays in the Park with George, and mm-hmm. it's all about George Seurat. And for people who don't know who George Seurat is, he's a French like post impressionist artist, and he painted this super detailed, very famous painting called A Sunday in the Afternoon. And there's a whole bunch more of the name, mm-hmm. but it's one in the park, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. it's literally like a Sunday. I'm gonna look. It's a Sunday afternoon on the island of Le Grand Jacques, and <laughs> it is. But the creation the of it, yeah. Yeah, and like the creation of it is um, Stephen Sondheim wrote this song called Finishing the Hat, which is like my favorite mm-hmm. Broadway song in any musical. And he talks, it's basically, it's told from the artist, George Surratt's point of view, where he's talking about like this painting. If people, I will put a link in the show notes if people will see mm-hmm. this painting. You need to see, like the size of it is is enormous, but like, and that's what makes this song so incredible because he's talking about how like the whole lyrics are like finishing the hat, You how you have to finish this hat, like, Mm-hmm. Like you study the world of the hat and like he's basically he writes he tells this whole story about this singular hat that he painted in this massive painting <laughs> and then at the very end of it he says like look I made a hat where there never was a hat and it's like this line that really is yeah. like an inspiration for me for writing but like it's sort of like the other way around like you were saying where this painting tells a story and it's all the things that you're seeing then you can create a story in your mind. Whereas for you, like when you're writing, you're thinking about all the things you would want to show someone visually, Mm -hmm. how to write it down Mm -hmm. into a story. Like, I think that's so fascinating about, because I want, yeah, like when I'm writing, I'm very much like character and conversation driven. I'm Mm -hmm. very bad at thinking like, where are they in the world? They're just some linear, (laughs) linear space. But like, I think that's really interesting. Like how, so how do you know when to kind of draw the line between like, okay, I've, set this beautiful stage but now I need mm-hmm. to inject some plot like how do you determine when it's time to step away <laughs> this is one of this this is actually going to come back to um George Seurat and um the 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 thing that I wanted to flag about this um is if it's the painting I'm thinking of um and I could be very wrong which would be very embarrassing but we're going to pretend that it is it's the one that has this gorgeous long landscape of all these people gathered and having like almost a picnic mm-hmm. um by the beach and like or not the beach but like you know in the in the park and yeah. one of the figures that that comes to mind is like a woman in the front with a large bustle and like i think she's got a, a parasol um yeah. you're nailing this i'm looking at it right now yes 
<laughs> my absolute deficit of art history classes is not catching me in the ass quite yet. Um, so here's the thing that's fascinating about that picture. If you zoom in real close, if you get really close, what you realize is that it's made of thousands upon thousands of tiny dots. Mm-hmm. It's a technique called stippling. Um, and it is, it's almost like, you know, a, it's the, you know, the ye olde version of pixelation almost. Um, and what you have to think about for me, or for me, I, you know, I actually take a lot of cues or like a lot of the, the sort of similar concepts of impressionism when I'm approaching writing, um, especially stuff that like I need to get through information, but I need it and I need it to be interesting, but I also need it to be fast. Mm-hmm. Um, so impressionism as a movement was initially um, regarded as like low class. It was it was required. Or it was viewed as an inferior art, which I also have a lot of thoughts about, mm-hmm. <laughs> particularly in the way that we talk about YA. Um, but you know, there's a it was it was viewed that way because it's the 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 act of communicating something in as few brushstrokes or as an in an unconventional way, you know, as possible. It's not not minimalism, but it's basically saying, I want to capture the thing that you look at for, you know, just a blink and then look away. Mm-hmm. And um, that does that means it's not necessarily going to be realistic. It's not going to be hyper-realistic. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be necessarily detailed. It's going to be, you know, smacks of paint on a canvas. But when you look, you know, and when you look at it up close, it's going to be nonsense. And when you step back, you see a, a you know, a pond of lilies. Mm-hmm. You see, uh, you know, you you make from these thousands of dots a, a you know, a huge landscape in the park. Mm-hmm. And each scene is a hat in that way. Each, like, it's made up of thousands of tiny words, thousands of tiny dots, that, but they all have to make the shape of a hat. Yeah. They all have to make the shape of the lady with the parasol. The, the you know, they all have to to communicate the the green of the lawn. Um, and when I'm writing a scene, um, you know, I, I, w- w- I always start with an outline of um, basically I have like a big broad outline of the entire book, um, but it's like very loose. Um, mm-hmm. And then I detail like I do a more in depth outline, but not too in depth of each act and then um, break that up for the act that I'm in, um, in specific events that happen. And then I break those into chapters and I then flesh out chapter by like one chapter at a time, I will flesh out the outline and then write the chapter and then Mm -hmm. start over again. And what that does is tell me what, you know, what kind of hat we're looking at. Yeah. You know, is this a Stetson? Is this, you know, a bowler hat? Is this a, is a messenger boy hat? Or are we moving on to the dog, you know? And uh, are, are, we, are we communicating the graphs? Um, and it gives me an idea of what is supposed to be communicated within this scene that's made up of thousands of words and moments that are interactions that are also building towards that. That is the best. Awesome. <laughs> that is such an. I love that answer so much, and it's like not to keep our art like pun <laughs> going, but it's like the forest for the tree situation where it's like it is. if you because obviously and you know this better than I would but like there you know there are there are writers who they're planners they're pantsers there's mm-hmm. people like for you it sounds like if you were just pantsing your way through you could very easily find yourself in a singular scene and write fourteen thousand words about you know the the sand and the mm-hmm. the light hitting the jewels and things, but <laughs> to have everything boxed out in a way where it's it's sort of like um improv where they're like, we don't know how we're gonna get there, but we know where we need to get to type of a yes. situation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I um I actually have a whole post on on it up on my Instagram that just sort of breaks it out. Um because I call it iterative uh, outlining mm-hmm. because it is basically a process of refining stage by stage by stage. Um, but the reason I, that I opted to do it that way is I found if I outlined extensively and exhaustively and I knew everything that was going to happen, uh, I would get bored. I would just be like, I don't, I don't, you know, there's no, no discovery here. And I'd box myself into an ending or, you know, to a third act that I was just sort of trudging into. Cause I was like, all right, well, this is a to-do list now. It's not, it's not an outline. Um, 
And, but at the same time, I get, um, <laughs> I think, executive dysfunction paralysis is the way I'd put it. Uh, if I don't have any outline, I, I won't write 14,000 words. I won't write a single damn one. Yeah. Like, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just like, you know, I'll stare at the, the, the Microsoft Word document with a little blinking cursor and there'll be like, you know, one little tadpole swimming around an empty tub and that's it. That's what's going on in my brain. Um, so, so it balance those two <laughs> yeah okay so so for painted devils your new book which is coming out which yes. is the second book mm-hmm. in a trilogy it's a follow-up to little yes. thieves let's uh-huh. um before we get to the book specifically i'm curious because you have done like duologies and you've you've written mm-hmm. connected stories before yeah. mm-hmm. so for this one being the second of three stories that are all mm-hmm. inter- interconnected obviously how do you as a person who has like meticulous plans like this, but you're also thinking about it, like you said, as a kind of like an artist, how do you know what encapsulates book two versus what should have gone in book one versus what should go in book three? Mm-hmm. So I, um, I think so. Mm. How am I going to make this, <laughs> how am I going to make this a concise answer? <laughs> um, the, so the short answer is that uh, I'm a child of the 90s and uh, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I wrote book one as a standalone. Mm. And what I mean by that is um, I think nowadays there's a, an approach to trilogies that is basically one story broken out over three parts. Mm-hmm. And I would say, you know, back back in my day, uh, the way that trilogies were approached in a lot of media is that it's three different stories following the, a similar cast of characters. Mm-hmm. And um, in that regard, that helped me with uh, carrying Little Thieves into a second and third book because I, as I was in the middle of writing Little Thieves, I was like, I could write about these characters forever. They have so much potential and it's so fun to write. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I want to write more. Um, but also I know that this is going to be a standalone. Um, and then I asked my editor and she's like, all right. <laughs> and it, it was slightly more complicated than that. Mm-hmm. But um, the uh, with that, I knew I was going to approach it from the perspective of each book is going to have its own central conflict and plot. Mm-hmm. It's going to still follow the same cast of characters and it's going to still follow the same POV. But what it does is transform Little Thieves, um, the character arc. It become goes from being a complete character arc to the first part of a character arc. Mm-hmm. And like the, for the first act of a three-act character arc. Yeah. Which um, has some fun results or some fun consequences in Painted Devils. Um, it's, you know, it's definitely the, the Empire Strikes Back of, of this, the trilogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... Um, you know, it was, it was, the, the intent was give this, um, give this, the story its own complete, you know, arc within it, and then have the character arc itself be what, what sustains the, the, the trilogy. But at the same time, I also keep running lists of like, I want to call on this. I want to tag back to this. I want to call back to this. I'm going to bring this in. I introduced this concept and now we're going to completely empty out the purse of what that is, that, that those implications are. Um, and it's been very fun, but also this book is going to be enormous. Yeah. <laughs> the third book is going to be so big. You can get away with it with the th- with once you have people hooked. You right, can get exactly. Away with it. Like it's like um, you know, if you think of really any like mm-hmm. series of books. I was gonna say Lord of the Rings, but I feel like all three of those are pretty pretty dense, but like um right. Chronicles of Narnia, you know, the um his dark materials, they do like kind of get right. obviously Harry Potter, like but yeah, I, I do know what you mean. In our day, because I think we're of similar age, there were <laughs> separate stories. Like, for example, the Mummy trilogy. We're bringing it back, everybody. We're bringing the it mummy, back. The mummy Returns and the, the terrible one with the dragon thing, which was not very good. Um, <laughs> so for people who are unfamiliar, can you kind of give them an introduction to Painted Devils or just like the the Little Thieves sort of a verse, if you will? Right. The, 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 the thief a verse. Yeah. No, I don't that at all all right I'll, I'll have to come up with a better one um so little so for those who haven't read little thieves um really quickly it is a sort of um upside down fairy tale um retelling of the goose girl which um is basically a, an old german fairy tale about a princess whose id gets sto- id and future betrothal all everything good in her life gets stolen by her wicked maid and um 
there's just, you know, a lot of drama involving geese and horse heads. And uh, eventually the truth comes out and the maid dies horribly. Uh, and this is the maid story. Um, and, I, you know, it's uh, the, the premise is that the main character has scammed her way into the identity of the princess that she used to serve. And um, wine, or, but she's also using that as a cover to steal uh, jewelry from the nobility that she is now mingling with um, to eventually fund an escape from the life that she's sort of trapped in right now. And then she crosses the wrong, wrong royal family, or well, not royal family, but nobility family, uh, winds up cursed by their patron deity and uh, is basically condemned to turn into jewels by the next full moon, unless she can make up for everything she's taken, including the princess's identity. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's that's a lot of fun. It, I had a lot of fun inverting tropes on that. Um, and uh, she, you know, it's, it's also sort of a uh, look at um, how isolation and independence can be a trauma response. Uh, and, you know, ask the question of why would a maid feel the need to steal her way out of her life, you know, out of this life. <laughs> um, and in the second book, Painted Devils, um, it's less of a direct retelling. Uh, if you squint, you can kind of see the the outlines of like the seven ravens, 12 swans, seven swans. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the number birds uh, <laughs> format of the, the fairy tale um, where a young woman has to go on a quest to save um, or to help or something involving, it's a quest involving birds. There are not actually any birds <laughs> made in devils. Um, but uh, the... Our our beloved uh, scam artist main character is back, and uh, she has um, accidentally started a cult. Mm-hmm. And her the boyfriend that she just ghosted a few months ago has shown up uh, because he is an investigator, and uh, he's been assigned to investigate this cult. And um, she is basically like, "Well, this is awkward for everybody, especially because I made up this god that we're all worshiping." And then the god actually manifests and claims him as a virgin sacrifice mm-hmm. and or claims her boy, her boyfriend, the ex-boyfriend that she ghosted as a virgin sacrifice. And they're, you know, sort of confronted with this thing of like, this is not a step to just, dis- we could disqualify you, but this is not a step where we're ready to take in our relationship yet. But how are we going to approach this? Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, searching for an alternative sacrifice and um, uncovering a lot about, you know, just without spoiling too much just various things yeah <laughs> uh, but yeah it's um also sort of supposed to be a um an unraveling of the uh, i i i have described it as an extended roast of the the concept the societal construct of virginity mm-hmm. uh, and looking at how that can be actually weaponized against people um and uh yeah it was it was um a lot of fun to write and I am sorry, not sorry for the way it ends. Because there's a third book on the way. <laughs> I was going to say, listen, it's the second book. It, I feel like it, for a second book of a trilogy, it, it, mm-hmm. it, second books of a trilogy have to, like the first book has to make you want to stay in that world. The right. third book has to make you feel like you're like, the last book has to make you feel like you've completed it. The second book needs to infuriate you when you get done because you need to get the <laughs> third book. That's just like, I feel like that's the best way to think. Like there's... um. I joked with uh, um, a friend of mine, Mallory O'Meara, who is mm-hmm. a past guest on the show. Uh, we joked when uh, she and I are both uh, his dark materials, like super fans. Mm-hmm. And so when the Book of Dust, the second book came out, mm-hmm. something Commonwealth, I don't remember what the first word was. It ends in such a second booky way. And we were both yeah. like, son of a bit. Like he, she was right. seeing me all caps. Like you this is a monster. Yeah. Uh-huh. But I can hear in your voice how much fun you had writing <laughs> this book. It sounds like you had a blast, like getting to kind of play in this space. I, I did. It was um well, and it's like to um to touch on the art aspect, Little Thieves and Painted Devils, and the third book um will well the like they are all illustrated by me. Uh, each one has seven different interstitials um, that are like f- flashbacks in the first one uh and i think yeah in the second one kind of um that are meant to illustrate um parts of why the main character is the way she is mm-hmm. and they're all illustrated in little thieves it was um digital illustrations that were meant to mimic um ink engravings and etchings mm-hmm. uh that, that were the kind of like old 
old fashioned fairy tale illustrations you find in like, you know, a 1900s um, book of fairy tales. Um, in Painted Devils, since this is a little more midsummer, um, <laughs> is a uh, woodcut or it's it's meant to look like woodcut. It's lino cut, which is linoleum, which is a lot easier to carve. But it is it was my first attempt at doing lino cut, um, which was also a lot of fun. But also, I did stab myself at least once. <laughs> um, it's 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 a it's a not an OSHA approved art form. In yeah. This but yeah, there's there's like these woodcut style illustrations in there that um, they also like. This was slightly a, a time saving thing, but also um, a stylistic thing. Uh, as the the narrator gets younger and younger in each story, um, the illustrations themselves become more simplistic and almost like um, rustic kind of looking. And um, it looks a little goofy in one of them, I think. But for the most part, it works. <laughs> what an incredible workaround. That's just that's just well done I mean, by you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, no one procrastinates as good as a Virgo. <laughs> like, we'll, yeah. make, we'll at least make it into an art form. <laughs> that, yeah, I was going to say, it's not procrastination. It's in the book. It's like, it's right. It's, you know, it's part of the story. So um, I, I always end every conversation by having the author come on and give a recommendation of any kind. It can be a book. It can be a movie. It can be, I've had someone recommend just go for a walk. Um, speak to <laughs> Valerie. She recommended a protein powder. Like any recommendation you would like to give that you think more people should know about? Yeah. Okay. So here's one. Um, this is for all the folks who have, like they're basically, you know, you're preparing your drinks at home. And by drinks, I mean like caffeinated beverages or just, you know, whatever you drink to work with. Um, it is so easy to make your own simple syrup. <laughs> like it is comedically easy to make your own simple syrup. And then you can put like, I, I make a pretty darn good um, brown sugar maple syrup or like not maple, but um, brown sugar simple syrup with a splash of vanilla and salt. So it almost has like the salted caramel aspect. Oh. And it is so much better than putting like grainy sugar in your in your coffee because you don't have like this weird sludge at the bottom of it um and like it's it's uh it's so much easier it you literally just do one to one ratio sugar to water in a pot and just before it boils you take it off like once the sugar's dissolved that's it you've you've made simple syrup and you've made your life so much simpler so much easier I, Listen, first off, I do also do this. I'm a cocktail maker. So I, the, the people, you don't understand how good of a tip Margaret just gave you because you're right. Once people realize how easy it is to make simple syrup, you yeah. just change it. I have a, I have a ginger one. I have a jalapeno one. I'm not even like a spicy drink person. I was just like, I had right. jalapenos. So I may, yeah. It, right. One to one, if you want to make a rich simple syrup, it's two to one sugar to water, but you don't have to. Mm -mm. Uh, what a good suggestion. What a good recommendation. <laughs> yeah. Why, thank you. Uh, Margaret, oh. I, the, the books are so, so wonderful. The last time we talked, it was all about the duology, the merciful crows, and, mm -hmm. and had so much fun. I, was, I told you before we started recording, I was so excited to have you back. Thank you oh. for joining me today. <laughs> of course. Thank you for having me. This has been delightful. <laughs> Passions and Prologues is proud to be an evergreen podcast and was created by Adam Sokol. It was produced by Adam Sokol and Sean Rule Hoffman. And if you are interested in this podcast and any other evergreen podcast, you can go to evergreenpodcast.com to discover all the different stories we have to tell. Hi there, I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one -on -one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, 
parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardknowpodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no.